Greek Orthodox Telecommunications presents Illuminations. Today's program, From Alexander to Cleopatra, Greek Art of the Hellenistic Age. Part 2 of a two-part series, The Coming of Rome. And welcome back. Today we conclude our visit to the Walters Art Gallery in Baltimore, Maryland and its magnificent exhibit of over 150 works of art dating from approximately 331 BC to 30 BC, the era of Greek Empire in the Eastern Mediterranean and Near East. Emerging with Alexander the Great's conquest of the Persian Empire in 331 BC and ending with Rome's defeat of Egypt in 30 BC, the Hellenistic Age witnessed the spreading of Greek civilization to Anatolia, Egypt, the Near East and India. This blending of Greek and native cultures gave rise to the international culture we term Hellenistic. The Hellenistic Age saw the birth of a new kind of Greek ruler, extremely powerful and wealthy monarchs who emulated the opulence of the Persian kings. The wealth of their royal courts prompted a demand for luxury goods, which inspired Hellenistic artists to new technical heights in gold jewelry and gem carving, and encouraged innovations in such exotic materials as faience, ivory, and glass. The products made for the royal courts, in turn, became prototypes for imitations made in less expensive materials. Subjects from the daily life of these diverse cultures, such as children, old people, dwarfs and hunchbacks, were depicted in Hellenistic art, resulting in a turning away from the classical, idealized vision of mankind. This is one of the most distinctive features of the Hellenistic Age, illustrating the international character of the times. Amidst this internationalism, a sense of insecurity developed, a consequence of the frequent and bloody battles that erupted among the vast Hellenistic kingdoms. This sense of confusion characterized the age and is evident in its art. Without control of their lives, people turned to the family and the home for support and structure. As never before in Greek civilization, the home became the center of family life and often acquired a grandeur without precedent. For the first time, people wanted to spend the money they had accumulated on their homes. At an age of wealthy monarchs who lived with great extravagance, affluent individuals tried to imitate the sumptuousness of court life in their own homes. We wanted to recreate for you the interior of a room in a Hellenistic house. And to do this, the curator visited the island of Delos, where many Hellenistic houses are still preserved. And she picked a room from the house of Hermes from the second century BC, which is still existing on Delos. It's a very elaborate house with two stories with a, co a colonnaded interior courtyard and rooms opening off the courtyard, such as this one that we cre recreated for you. From the courtyard, there are windows opened into the room so that you can uh, get light into the room, and the walls of the room are decorated with some of this detailing we've recreated for you here. Within the home, there were beds, chests, and tables made of wood and bronze, often richly inlaid with ivory. A reproduction of a wall painting from the period shows a woman seated on a bed which is draped with a silk coverlet. 
A similar modern coverlet with embroidery decorating the bottom lies on the Walters bed. This bronze version is the only example in this country of a complete Hellenistic bed. It is the same type that might be seen upstairs in a sleeping room. When used in a dining room, beds called kline were arranged around the perimeter of the room, head to toe. The men would recline on their left elbows and they would be served wine and food by attendants. We also show you a, um, a relief of a, of a man reclining on a bed. This was actually um, a grave relief. Um, it, he was shown having the, the meal of the dead and he's served by servant figures and his wife is sitting by him. But you can see he's reclining just up on one elbow, uh, just like you would see in one of these beds. And he has a rectangular table placed in front of him that has uh, some of the implements of the meal in front of him. Household objects were a delight to the eye and invited the finger's touch, such as cups made of silver, clay, and faience. Some of these household objects have been placed on a reconstructed table, which would have been placed in front of the bed during a meal. What is striking about all three of the objects on this table is how very small-scaled they are. Most of the Hellenistic houses were not outfitted with enormous numbers of objects. But the objects that did exist were beautifully crafted and were scaled to fit easily into the hand. The objects that people collected in their homes had a very tactile quality and almost begged to be touched. Mirrors opened like modern compacts, revealing richly polished interior surfaces. Finely crafted glass vessels held precious perfumed oils. Yet household objects were not just for display. The wealth of both the rich and middle class were kept in gold and silver objects which could always serve as bullion. Thus, these objects stored their owner's assets. They were fairly portable, relatively easy to hide, and could always be sold. A private home would probably also have a household shrine, and although we couldn't really recreate with any uh, real sense of true feeling a shrine for you, we've gathered together three objects depicting the god Serapis, and perhaps you'll get a sense from that of what might have been held in these, in these household cults. Um, Serapis was a god that became very popular in the Hellenistic period. He almost superseded the 12 Olympian gods because he himself had such overwhelming powers uh, through, through um, all facets of life uh, that, that he was more like one all-powerful god that led up perhaps to the monotheism that was Christianity. Serapis was, was depicted with long locks and a long flowing beard, and he had an object on his head which was used as a measure for wheat, and that, that showed his connection with abundance. We have a gold medallion showing the god Serapis, a heavy bronze ring, and also a glass bust that was cast in glass. Also displayed in the home, on shelves and in niches, were ornamental vases and statuettes of the nude Aphrodite, the goddess of love. From the ceiling hung figurines of Eros, better known by his Latin name Cupid, and Nike, the winged goddess of victory. This is a terracotta applique of the late 5th, early 4th century style that would have been made for attachment to a vase. To my left are two examples of vase painting of the fourth century. This example here is one of the finest vases in the Walters Art Gallery. It's made in the Kirch style, which means that there are many delicate figures with added detail, added color, and even gilding, which is gold, added to the surface for extra richness. You can see that the poses of the figures are very graceful and delicate. The, sh the woman, the seated woman in the front is actually shown playing a game of knuckle bones with a satyr. And if you look closely, she's throwing the knuckle bones up and catching them on the back of her hand. These were love oracles or games where if you threw them up and caught them, you would know the outcome of your love. The larger vase shows similarly gracefully posed figures, a preening goddess on the right, a seated eros with outstretched wings, and other gracefully posed figures. 
At this point in the development of, Gra of Vey's painting, the graceful poses are really more decorative than informative. Increasingly, the preoccupations of the age found their expression in contemporary art. The yearning for escape sensed in the literature of this often troubled and tumultuous time can be seen in the portrayal of such objects as Pan and nymphs, and in the withdrawn musing of the famed Tanagra figurines. These maidens are recognized as examples of the famous Tanagra figurines, which take their name from a site in Greece, because they usually depict beautifully dressed ladies standing quietly, either lost in thought or seeming to talk to each other. Excavations have shown that some Hellenistic homes actually had whole collections of these Tanagra figurines. Once again, the artist's primary interest is in creating very elaborate drapery designs which are represented in the different ways in which these fine fabrics fall and are wrapped around the bodies of the women. Another pattern can be seen in the elaborate hairstyles. This was the fashionable coiffure of the time, known as the melon hairstyle, because the twisted sections of hair look like the veins on the outside of a cantaloupe, or a melon. These groups of figures beautifully illustrate the spirit of artistic experimentation in Hellenistic times. This may be the first time a figure depicts two people locked together in a single composition in very complex poses. They need to be encircled for the viewer to understand what is going on, as well as to enjoy the composition to the fullest. Whereas in classical art, the figure could be understood by the viewer standing directly in front of it. There is a new emphasis here on movement and the element of time. The immediacy and spontaneity of the moment is felt as well as an awareness that a specific action is being carried out and is captured as if by a camera's lens. By contrast, the classical figures seem to be posed for eternity, suspended in time. The subject of these figures is something new also. These are not gods or heroes or great mythological beings. They are ordinary people who would have been part of the daily landscape of the age. This wrestling group shows one competitor lifting his opponent off the ground. We can tell that these men are professional athletes because of the ponytail on the top of the victor's head. In the Hellenistic age, professional athletes were very common. They traveled from one festival to another competing, and by Roman times they had large fan clubs, like modern-day groupies. Hellenistic artists exulted in displaying their technical skills. Silver vessels were festooned with garlands and blossoms rendered in high relief. Gem engravers carved intricate detail on a minute scale. The fabulous jewelry in this case was found at the end of the last century BC in a tomb on the shores of the Black Sea in a city called Olbia. Olbia was a flourishing commercial center that exported grain and slaves. The tremendous wealth of its citizens is witnessed by the bracelets and necklaces seen here. The tradition of goldsmithery of the Hellenistic age has survived to the present time. Goldsmiths of today use modern techniques as well as ancient ones, which have been adapted by modern machinery. One of these master craftsmen is Elias Lalaunis, we spoke with his daughter, Dimitra Lalaunis, in their New York City gallery. Hellenistic art is important because of the wealth of information it gives you, not only about the art itself, but also about the people that created it. It has a number of designs that are very important, that you see different civilizations following the Hellenistic civilization using them. And it's not only because of the design, but also because of the meanings behind it. One of them is a very obvious one is the Hercules knot, which we've been using uh, since the early 60s very extensively in different renderings with different techniques 
some typically Hellenistic with granulation and filigree, some more embellished that also shows the influence of more uh, Islamic, Persian, Arabic art into Hellenistic art. So we see a wealth of information, in, very interesting to us from the design point of view and from the meaning of the designs themselves. The necklace with the butterfly pendant is composed of emeralds, garnets, pearls and uh, rock crystals. These are materials that were unavailable to craftsmen before the flowering of trade during this era. Emeralds came from the Ural Mountains, pearls from the Arabian Gulf and garnets from India. And a, a lot of glass is in this piece. Glass is another material that was now available as it had not been before. Very typical of the Hellenistic era are the lavish gold settings in which the stones are placed. One of the pieces that catches one's attention from the Walters collection is a necklace with precious stones, 22 karat gold, uh, and depicting a butterfly. A butterfly symbolizing the soul is a very enticing subject matter. It's a very has mystical connotations. So it's wonderful to render it and to tell to the people that you know it's not only the design, but again the symbol, the idea behind it. The butterfly I'm wearing is very different from the butterfly that you see uh, on the leg necklace of the Walters collection because there are no precious stones. It's not 22 karat gold, but still it has that special quality, intricate workmanship, 18 karat gold. The pair of gold bracelets in the Walters collection are lavish by any standards. Upon close inspection, small beads of gold that are stuck onto the surface can be seen, forming very intricate, delicate designs. This is a technique in goldsmith work known as granulation, and it required enormous technical skill. Fine enamel work can be seen on these bracelets also, and of course, the precious stones are dazzling, garnets, pearls, and emeralds. I'd like to mention another piece where you can see very well the links between our work and the past, and it's in a neck, in a bracelet actually, excuse me, with uh, antelope heads. Uh, for example, you see minor changes that we've made enough so that we don't call it a copy, we call it an inspiration because we've added our own touch. And we see again the same use of metal, 22 karat gold, at the time they used 24, sometimes they used other uh, materials to harden it, but quite a lot of 24. We use 22 because for the modern woman to wear it today, it has to be durable enough, we don't want it to dent or break too easily. So we see a 22 karat gold bracelet, very yellow gold, which gives itself uh, to a lot of different renderings as far as technique. It's soft enough that the technician can do a lot of things with it. And in this particular piece, we can see the thin wire that swirls around the bracelet. And this is a filigree wire. We see granulation on the head. We see detail of the expression of the antelope head. Um, and a hinge which is very easy to wear, maybe not for the morning, but definitely something that one could wear in a more um, you know, formal affair, maybe. So you can see a close link, but yet not identical. Adaptations made for purely technical reasons and just because it's easier for the modern woman to wear it today in this way. So in the Walters collection, there are many wonderful pieces representing animals. And here I have some show, to show you uh, some that are very closely linked to the ones at the Walters collection and some others that have been inspired by different pieces. We have ram's heads. As I said, animal's heads were usually um, showing the symbols of power, of strength, with intricate workmanships of granulation and filigree. A different treatment of another ram's head. Less intricate workmanship on the torso of the piece. Now these are bracelets, we can see how the intricate motif can be also executed in a very small piece, such as a ring. Here we have a line with very few precious stones, and the most important part is the intricate workmanships, the rendering of the head of the lion and of the torso. And some different pieces 
more elaborate, for example, with precious stones, a much more intricate face, heavier pieces, an even heavier piece with a double lion crossed rather than facing each other. And as you can see, just a variety of techniques. Let me show you the more simplified one, being a 22 karat gold hammered, no stone, no filigree, no granulation, just the pure, simple, um, and very primitive way of hammering gold. If I may show you a piece that exemplifies the utmost in Hellenistic jewelry, it's the one that's similar to the necklace that you have in the Walter collection, and it's the necklace representing the Hercules knot. We have created many similar designs using the Hercules knot as a central motif and embellishing it with different techniques, some typical Hellenistic, some, as I said before, more uh, ornate. For example, in this necklace here, you can see that we are using the same metal, which is gold, no stones, uh, as the Walter necklace is showing, but with typically Hellenistic tradition of craftsmanship, meaning the granulation decorated on the motif itself. Now we can take this motif and represent it in many other ways, some that still are Hellenistic, maybe more classical, maybe more Baroque, meaning more Islamic influence or whatever other influence that piece may have had throughout the span of Hellenistic art. As illustrated in Hellenistic jewelry, traditional Greek styles mingle with artistic traditions from Egypt and the Near East. Sculpture also reveals both Egyptian and Greek traits. In this first case, you'll see uh, pieces that are very characteristic of traditional Egyptian styles. But if you look very closely at them, you can see a mixture of the Egyptian and classical as the two uh, styles have had a chance to blend and merge. In this figurine of Isis, who I've mentioned before, as the Ptolemaic queens try to depict themselves in her likeness, you can see that although she has all the attributes of the traditional uh, deity, she's also got in her face and in treatment of her drapery uh, a lot of the classical characteristics as well. There is a fusion of the two artistic traditions represented in this figure. The high headdress, the elaborate wig, and the almond-shaped eyes are very Egyptian in style. The pose is typically rigid and frontal, with the outstretched arm holding a cobra, the symbol of Isis in Egyptian iconography. But the fleshiness of her face and of her form are very much in the Greek tradition of portraying the human anatomy convincingly. And the drapery wrapped around her body reminds us of the Tanagra ladies. The enormous popularity of Isis, even in Athens at this time, was a consequence of the new, very complex atmosphere of the age. People were finding that the old Olympian deities were no longer providing all the answers. So they were willing to turn elsewhere and to be tolerant of other religions and other solutions to spiritual unrest. It was this growing ecumenical mood that enabled gods like Isis to gain a footing. At the same time, it was this searching and this willingness to listen that created the ideal breeding ground for Christianity, which emerges at the end of the Hellenistic Age. In Asia Minor, which is where modern-day Turkey is located, this was the area where the Pergamene Kingdom was in Hellenistic times. Um, the sculptural traditions in marble of large-scale sculpture had continued all through the Hellenistic period. Uh, this example of a large statue, almost twice life size, of a woman shows how the monumental marble sculpture tradition was kept alive. Um, here we see a monumental figure, um, probably the largest figure in our exhibition. She's twice life size, but as you can see, her pose is very much like some of the maidens we saw earlier in the Tanagra figurines. Um, her drapery is very complicated, and this indicates to us that she comes from the very end of the Hellenistic period. And finally, we see here in this portrait of Augustus an example of the classicistic style. 
Um, Augustus really belongs outside of the Hellenistic period, but we show here what happened in the Roman period when he created a portrait for himself that was very much based on the fifth century golden age styles of classical Greece. He took those classical features, the ideal features, and embodied them in his portrait, much as Alexander had done to create a portrait of himself that was very symbolic of his position. Uh, Augustus did the same with creating a classical style for his own portrait. Um, he created a statement for himself, uh, uh, establishing himself as a ruler that would relate back to the golden age of classical Greece. The spirit of the Hellenistic world survived during Augustus' rule throughout the Roman Empire. The Romans came to the Eastern Mediterranean primarily as administrators. The culture of this area had been well developed over several centuries and was very sophisticated by Roman standards. And so, the same values, the same way of life that is represented in this exhibition remained essentially untouched by the Roman presence. The bustling cities and elegant houses, the lively festivals with uh, traveling athletes and entertainers, and the receptive, energetic outlook of the Hellenistic people continued unchanged well into Byzantine times. The Latin poet Horace, writing at about the time of Christ, made the keen observation that though Greece was a captive of Rome, she had actually taken Rome as her captive. The new tolerance, the unprecedented global view of mankind of the Hellenistic age, prompted Hellenistic poets and philosophers to proclaim, I am a human being and reckon all that affects any man affects me, and my country has no single tower, no single roof. Its citadel belongs to all the world. The Hellenistic age saw Greek culture spread far and beyond Greek shores, to be in turn invigorated and enriched through contacts with foreign cultures. The era that Alexander the Great initiated exerted an impact for centuries afterwards on Egypt the Near East, and the Mediterranean world. From the Walters Art Gallery in Baltimore, Maryland, this is Yanni Simonidis. Thank you for joining us. The preceding program was brought to you in part by grants from Amic Enterprises Incorporated, National Greek Orthodox Ladies Philophthos Society, the Michael Jaharis Foundation, the Gus and Nick Karos Fund, the Dr. and Mrs. John Collis Fund, and Cragen Lang Incorporated. This has been a Greek Orthodox Telecommunications production.